We have been in a series in the book of Philippians, and, and Tim has kind of finished part of uh, chapter 1, I'm going to finish the rest of it. And today, we, where it's been going is that Paul has been encouraging the church in, in Philippi. He's been uh, letting them know that he is encouraged by the partnership that they have with him, and also encouraging them that even in the midst of crazy circumstances and things that he did not intend to happen, as he's sitting in a Roman jail as he is locked up and chained to people, probably 24-7, the gospel message is continuing to spread in a way like they never could have anticipated. And it makes me even emotional thinking about that, that in the midst of these crazy circumstances and things that weren't planned, people are coming to know Jesus. And I believe that the gospel was spreading far beyond what they even imagined at that time. And so I want to read, starting uh, in verse 16, excuse me, in 19, going through the end of the chapter. And it says, Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Here's the part we're going to focus on today. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. And so Paul goes here, in, in the first part, he's talking about some things that he is hopeful for, that he's desiring to get back to meet with them, and he shifts to some things that are current, and what's, what's facing him right then, and also what he sees that is going to be pressing against the, the Philippian church. And this is, a, this is a group of people that, as he's writing to this, what he's saying and live in a manner worthy of the gospel is to behave as citizens worthy. When we become Christ followers, our, the way that we live, our witness impacts Jesus' witness, it impacts the church's witness, and it impacts the witness of other believers as well. And so if we claim the name of Jesus, and we see this all the time, we claim the name of Jesus and we live a life that completely contradicts that, we're not being a positive witness. We're not being somebody that is living worthy of the manner of of that. And so I want to, as we look at this, just think about Philippi was a Roman colony at this point. They had gotten made a Roman colony by Caesar Augustus, and that was something that they were kind of prideful about. With that came some different privileges. It came some different laws and different things that they were, they were covered by under that. And you think about some parallels. I think sometimes we have that as well in our American culture, that we, we kind of have these laws that protect us and these different things. And so there's some parallel in what we're going to be reading today. And the main point of this is, like I said, it's living in a manner worthy of the gospel. That as Christ followers, we are to behave in a way that points people to Jesus. We are to behave in a way that is a good representation of the church, that is a good representation of other believers. And he gives us some things in here. And so in Acts 22, I'm going to read a passage out of Acts 22. This is an instance where we see Paul... And he's, his Roman citizenship is actually coming in to play in a positive way. He is about to be flogged. He's about to be beaten. And under this Roman law, and Paul being a Roman citizen, it actually gets him out of this. And we'll look at this in, in verse 22. Verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 25. It says, But when they had stretched him out for the whip, so they're getting ready to let him have it. When they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said, to the centurion who was standing by. Is it lawful for you to flog a man who was a Roman citizen and uncondemned? 
When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune, and he said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul, Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So there's, you see that there's corruption even in the midst of this. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. So Paul, fall, falling under that Roman citizenship, there's some privileges and things that he, he is kind of eligible for. And you think about a little bit in our culture, there are things as Americans or even people that live in the world that we have some different freedoms. And, and one of the things that I think we get out of balance is like he's telling us here is we are to behave as citizens of heaven, to behave as citizens that are Christ followers. We are part of a different community. We belong to something different. And I think at times I view everything through lenses is, is we have a lens as Christ followers that we need to view the world through. And sometimes also our, our local kind of American mindset is there. And sometimes those aren't in sync and we need to remove our, our American mindset and look through the gospel mindset to see how we interact with the world and to see how we interact with people and other believers. So Paul urges the church here to live in the Roman colony of Philippi as worthy citizens of your heavenly uh, citizenship, of your heavenly homeland. So we're here temporarily. We are called to live differently. We are called to be light in the darkness. We are called to be salt and bring restoration to people that need a relationship with Jesus. Later in chapter 3, Paul uses an illustration where it's talking about this, this same thing, that we are citizens in heaven in contrast to those whose minds are on earth. And so you think about kind of sometimes our American culture and our, our Christ-like culture and the way that we should live, they don't always intersect. And we need to remove the one that is not our Christ-like one. Paul goes on in here and he urges them that it's something that's supposed to be continual. And so he says, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This isn't something that when I walk out the door, I put my coat on, I put my hat on. When it's game day, I've got a Marcus Mariota jersey that I like to put on. It's not something that I put on for those instances and then I take off later. But it's those things that we, we are supposed to be a Christ follower all the time. We are called to live that out. When we surrender our life to Jesus and we surrender to him and we have a relationship with him, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works in us to do some pretty amazing things. And through that, it changes who we are. He also goes on in here, then he says, to stand firm and united in one spirit and one mind. And I would say kind of in a gospel mission. So, so whether I come to you or I'm absent, that I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign of them, of their destruction, but of your salvation that is from God. What does it look like for a community of people, a community of believers to be one in spirit. What does that look like? I, I want to flip over and look in Galatians 5. And I think that when you look at Galatians 5 and this passage that I read, if you have a community of people, a church of people, the, the church globally that lives this out, you're going to have a church that is united in spirit. Move my mark here. Uh, 5, starting in verse 16. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, if we have a community of people that live this out, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
So when we look at, we are here in America, if you, most of you um, are hearing this, we have laws, but guess what? You can love, and that's not going to break any laws. You can be kind, and that's not going to break any laws. We can be patient, and that's not going to be breaking any laws. So there's no laws. And uh, those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified in the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When you look at the opposites here, you've got the flesh, which is really self-focused. It's about kind of instant gratification. And then you've got the spirit, which is focused outward on other people. And so we sometimes in the midst of groups and people, I know even sometimes with my wife that there are times that we are in harmony and we are in sync. And there are sometimes that there's issues that are going on. And it's evident to the people around us. I know there are times that we show up to church back when we could meet. And it's been a hard Sunday trying to get the boys ready, get out of the house, and we're kind of at odds. We roll up into the parking lot, and it's like we kind of look at each other and put our game face on and go in. Does that mean that we are all perfect? No, it doesn't. We, we sometimes will share that. But it, it's, there's a difference in being in harmony and really people seeing that and when there's struggle and tension. We, as Christ followers, as the church, we need to be one in spirit. We need to be living this out. Right now, in our culture and in the things that are happening, there's probably never a better time, I think, than to refocus on this and to look at this. And that last song that we sang talked about his willingness to go after those people and to love them and to, to suffer because he desires to see people come into a relationship with him. And we look at what is going on in our culture, within the church, within, within different things, there is division, there's dissension, there's things that are happening that people are angry and hurting. And we need to live this out in our lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our church community, and in our community. If we take love and kindness and peace and gentleness to those people that maybe see things differently than us, and we hear what it is that they have to say, that's going to impact. Uh, recently, there was a, a protest here in Malala. and not saying one side or the other, but I, I ended up driving through it. And you had one group on one side and one group on the other. And they're just yelling at each other. And as I look, I know those people on each side, they, they have a desire to, to say that something is right. But is just yelling at each other going to solve anything? It's, it's not. I don't think it's going to. If, if you were to maybe pull somebody aside and try to have a conversation and hear the reason for it and hear the heart behind it and listen to them and have some kindness in the midst of it and have some love, you might get somewhere. And so the, the second part that he says is we are supposed to be unified in spirit, but then we're also supposed to be unified in mind. As we receive, uh, accept a relationship with Jesus, as we surrender our life to him, we're given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in us if we allow him to, to make some incredible change in our life. And so we begin to see this fruit flowing out of us. We, we, we see that fruit and it's changing us. It doesn't happen instantly, but it happens over time as we mature in our relationship with Christ. Our mindset also changes. And so if we're unified in spirit and the, the Holy Spirit is working in us and we all have that saying, we're unified, our mindset changes too. Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. As the Spirit of God works in our life, our mindset changes. And again, I, I talk about with marriage, I realize I still am a pretty selfish person. And so when you get married, you are now splitting your time with somebody else. You're splitting your money with somebody else. You're splitting the things that you do, all of this with somebody else. And so it's pretty revealing if you're selfish. When you have kids, it's even more revealing to you how selfish you are. And so I realize I'm a pretty selfish person. And God's continuing to work on me through this. But my mindset is sometimes self-focused. And I have to really work to see things differently. And I think that as I grow in my relationship with the Lord, as I grow in my marriage, as I'm growing even in being a parent, that it's changing and God is working on me through his Holy Spirit. And so there's a kingdom mindset, one that I think is kind of that heavenly citizenship. And there sometimes is an earthly mindset, that one that is here. And so when, when we see something or we're offended by something, we have to react to it instantly. I, I heard an illustration years ago, and it's just comparing a hummingbird and a crow or a raven. A hummingbird, I just saw one recently in my backyard, a hummingbird goes around and when it takes off out of the nest, it goes out and it finds sweet nectar because what's it looking for? Sweet nectar, it's looking for good things. A crow, a raven, when they take off, what do they find? Anything and everything that they can find. 
nasty things, dead things. It's usually just a little bit of everything. And so what they're looking for is what they find. Our mindset as Christ followers, hopefully as the Spirit of God works in us, changes, that we begin to see people differently. We begin to see them for who God has created them to be. We don't see them maybe for something that they're yelling at us or they're frustrated about. We begin to see the heart of the matter and who they are. Brandon Heath has a song, and it's, it's called Give Me Your Eyes. And I, I love that song because in that song, he's, he's saying a prayer that he wants to see the world differently. And all these people that he normally just walks past and walks by and, and sometimes doesn't take the time to see, he wants to see those people that are hurting. He wants to see those people that are broken. He wants to see them the way that Jesus see them sees them so that he has a heart for them the way that Jesus has a heart for them. So that hummingbird illustration, the other part, when our mind is different, instead of trying to prove somebody right all the time, right now, again, we've talked a lot about social media. You see people just arguing back and forth and, and just, it's like they have to prove their point, right? Slow down on that. Use a filter right now. Is, is, it, is it something that is a kingdom issue? Is it sin or is it something that's trivial? And we maybe need to approach it can really differently with joy and peace and love that we can have a conversation and a dialogue with somebody instead of trying to prove them right, or prove them wrong, I mean, and prove ourselves right. Look for kind of the common ground. Again, we are really divided right now. Like I said, I drove through that, that uh, protest the other day. I would have loved to see actually some of those people, and it could have happened, engaged in a conversation with one another, and not, not just yelling, like you've seen some of the pictures and stuff where people are just yelling at each other. There's no listening that's taking place in that. When Andrew and I get to do, we get to do a lot of uh, premarital counseling with people. One of the biggest things we talk about is communication. That there's different ways to communicate. And we need to, when we're in conversation with somebody, we need to listen, not in order to be able to respond back, but listen to actually hear what the person is saying. When Andrew and I are fighting or she's mad at me, usually what she, I'm not saying she's always mad at me, but in this case, when, when she is upset at me and I ask her why, usually what she'll tell me is not the real reason. And so you can all probably, I have to kind of root through a little bit and I have to do some digging and I have to work to get to what the real issue is. And so even right now in everything that's going on, instead of seeing maybe where somebody is politically that's different than you or on the other side of an issue, dig, do some digging, see who they are, see who God has made them to be, see what it is that they're passionate about, what they desire, have a different mindset that looks at them but through the eyes of Christ, to see that Jesus might be using you to introduce that person to him. That as you love that person, as you are unified, the body of Christ, in spirit and in mind, we can impact the culture around us. Because like he talks about in here, that people are going to see their destruction, or they're going to see that our salvation, and that it comes through God. And my prayer is that people will see in our lives, as we, Christ the King, and the body of Christ are unified, that they're going to see that this is something different, this is something radical, and they desire to know more about that, instead of being completely offended because we fly off the cuff and we react the same way that everybody else is reacting. And thinking about, too, just being contrary, somebody that has to always prove everybody right. As a Christ follower, if, if that's you, like, I, I would encourage you to really process through, again, and use the filter. Is there something that needs to take place for you to be able to go, you know what, this isn't a big issue. This isn't a big issue. Is, is the way that somebody loads my dishwasher, if they do it differently than me, does it really matter? Is that something that I need to say? Yeah. Now, I'm saying this, yeah, and Andrea says no, because we do see differently on some things. But uh, is, is, is when we leave to go somewhere and there's different routes to the same destination, you think about there's different ways to do things. We don't always have to tell everybody the way that we would do it. We don't always have to tell them, like, hey, this is the better way. Think about that filter. Is it a kingdom issue? Is it sin? Is it something that we need to address? Or is it something that we can just step back and we can support them in? Because you think about those people that are like that, they're kind of annoying to me. That's, that's my opinion. If you have somebody that's a know-it-all, you, they get annoying. Because you know everything you say, you're going to hear their opinion. As a Christ follower, I think there's something to it that we shouldn't be that way. That as the Spirit of God works in us, that as we are unified in spirit, as we are unified in mind, that our mind changes... We need to look at things differently and the way that people say them differently and who they are differently. So use that filter. Is it a kingdom issue? Is it sin? Something that needs to be addressed? Or maybe we step back and we just let it happen. And we look at them with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Have a little bit of self-control and be quiet in the midst of that situation. 
But then he also says to be unified in the gospel mission. So you think about side by side. They're, they're unified in what's going on because now they are of one spirit, one heartbeat. They have one mind going in a direction. Now they're working together. Last week or the week before, we got together with my sister and brother-in-law, and they have two kids. So I have a six-year-old, Bryce, Blake, who's five, my nephew, Liam, who is five, and then Nolan, who is three. So the four of these little boys picked up like a 10-foot stick. It was like a small tree, actually. And they were running around this park, all of them holding on to the stick. And you can imagine what was happening in the midst of this, because every one of them wanted to be in charge. You have two older brothers in the midst of this that are used to telling their little brother what to do. And so initially this stick is just going every which way and it just depended on what was going on and who was getting the momentum that they were going all over the place. And poor little Nolan's just holding on to it, trying not to get taken out. And eventually they coordinated what they were trying to do and they were like using it as a ramrod into the fence that they were trying to take down a chain link fence. They're not big enough to do it. But that's the same kind of idea here is sometimes when we aren't unified, in spirit, when we're not taking the time to study God's word, when we're not taking the time to allow him to change us and allow him to change our mindset, we're out of sync just like that. And instead of being unified in the direction of where we're going with the mission of the gospel, it looks like chaos. And I think we see that a little bit right now. I think at Christ the King, we have a pretty good culture and we have a pretty healthy culture where we can address things and work through things. And there's a lot of love and grace in the midst of that. And so I just encourage that we continue to be that way. But looking at this situation, unified in the mission of the gospel. So one spirit, one mind working together. We can have a huge impact in our community locally and globally. One of the cool things right now is, I think Tim talked about this a little bit, but as we've had to make changes, shifts, things that we weren't expecting or anticipating to do, that God is using it. Just like when Paul is in jail here in Rome, he is reaching people with the gospel in a situation that he didn't plan, that he probably never would have been with outside of those circumstances taking place. It's cool. I get to see sometimes the backside of the Facebook live feed. We have people watching in Alaska. We have people that are, are tuning in from Washington, people from California, Texas, and even there's a few other states that are sprinkled in. So in the midst of what's going on, God has taken, and I think he's expanding the gospel message and the gospel reach. And so instead of us even at times all being there at Baker Prairie, we're now getting to meet. I've got a room full of people around me in a house church, and we get to encourage one another. And so our church has multiplied, essentially, and the gospel message is the reach is farther in the midst of this situation. So he's, he's, he's going into unified in spirit, in mind, really working together, but there's a reason for it. He's encouraging them that they can stand firm no matter what, they're not alone. They have each other. They have the example that he has set for them. And ultimately, Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, like that song before we just sang, that he was willing to suffer so that people would come to know him. He was an ultimate servant. 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. The disciples telling people this. Um, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. As we are unified, as we are one, as we have one heartbeat, and we, we are able to love the community around us and have a different approach to the way that we interact with people, my prayer is that people will be reconciled to God, that they will come to know who Jesus is, that they will come to a relationship with him, that the Spirit of God will work in them, and they can join in with the ministry of what is taking place. But why do we need to live a life that is worthy of the gospel? It's not something that we do in order to earn salvation. It's not something that we're doing in order to please God. That's a free gift that he has given us. But I think it's one, because we can impact the community around us. But two, in this, as Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, they're about to face something. And so he's preparing them for something. He gets into the real reason of why he is saying all of this. And I think it comes down to that they're strengthened in their faith. So they're, they're unified, they're together, they're one, and they're ready to kind of be able to continue to serve the Lord no matter what takes place. 4 and 29, it says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. We see Paul suffering. We see Paul in jail, locked up to people, but yet he's preaching the gospel. But yet this whole book of Philippians, 
He is preaching this message of joy in the midst of the circumstances because it's not about what's happening to him here on earth. He is looking for the prize of eternity with his heavenly father. And so he's encouraging us to do the same thing. We're going to struggle. There's going to be things that come against us. The Philippian church, there's going to be persecution. They're facing it right now during this time that he's writing this. There is oppression. There's people that are coming against them. And he wants them to be able to stand firm in the midst of that and to not waver and to be, be unified in it. Not to overpower, but to be an example of Christ and to serve those people that are around and to be able to endure. Because Paul talks about um, later in, in Philippians 2 that he, he's run the race and he's running it to win the prize. And that prize is to spend eternity with Jesus. That's what it's all about. And so Paul is suffering here in this Roman jail and he realizes he can impact other people for the gospel in the midst of that. So we can be encouraged by the examples that we have to follow. We've seen Paul do it. We've seen other disciples do it. The ultimate one, we've seen Jesus do it. So how do we live a life that is worthy of the gospel, in a manner worthy of the gospel? We're unified in spirit. We're unified in mind. We stand side by side, but it takes each one of us individually allowing that relationship with Jesus to grow. We need to pursue it. We need to pursue that relationship with Christ, study his word, allow the spirit of God to work in us. Because if, if we don't, we're going to have conflict. We're not going to be all going the same direction. It's going to be like my boys and my nephews with that stick. It's just going to be spinning in a circle because nobody's going the same way. And so my prayer and my hope is that we can, in any circumstances that we face, whether we are quarantined and locked down, whether there is chaos going on around us, that we can continue to be a light in the darkness for Christ, that we can continue to be a community here at Christ the King, the whole network of Christ the King, the, the church globally, that we can be light right now in the darkness, that we can be a, a place of love, a place of acceptance, a place that is reaching people and listening to people and hearing people that maybe right now are feeling like they're not being heard. Shouting at people, posting things on Facebook, social media, all that stuff. It's not the real heart, I don't think, of what it is that God desires for us to do as the, the Christian community. How do we reach people where they're at in their homes? Like I said with Andrea, i got to dig sometimes to get the real reason of what things are bothering her. So my prayer is that there will be a revival, that people will come to know him through us being unified, living it out just like the Philippian church was, so that people, years later, can know the gospel. We pray with me. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to, to gather together and to, uh, even right now, that we get to be in house churches, that we get to be in community groups, uh, even to be streaming things online. Lord, I thank you that your gospel message continues to reach farther and farther, not just from Christ the King, but the church as a whole. God, I ask that you will continue to work in each one of our lives individually so that as a community we can be unified. God, that we can be one in spirit that has a heartbeat for you, that has a mindset that is not focused on our earthly citizenship, but on our heavenly citizenship, that we see things through the lens of eternity, that we see people through the lens of eternity, and we see them so that we can love on them and be a light for Christ to them, Lord. And so we just lift that up, and we thank you for today, and I thank you for everybody that's here to join us uh, here in our living room. We just thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.